You're good? All right. Um, it's 1.30. Why don't we get going and start with the Pledge of Allegiance? Testing. <coughs> Testing. Testing. Hello. Testing. Thank you. Just a friendly reminder, when you are speaking, make sure you are right up on that mic. Okay. Um, can we do the roll call, please? Mike Petroff. Present. Ian Milne. Present. Sean Harrigan. Uh, present. Stuart Griffinberg. Present. Rick Darty. All right. Um, we don't have any public, so I'll call for public comments. But going once, twice, three times, done. And we actually have a special item under call to order this month. Oh, um, call to order. Roll call, pledge of allegiance, announcements. The next meeting is going to be March 14th in 2023. Is everybody going to be present? Yes. Yes, Ian, yes. Okay. And we should have um, elections on there? We do. Okay, good. All right. In that case, I can start that if you'd like. Please. Okay, so we are going to begin giving a presentation each year of uh, an overview of what the duties are for the chair and vice chair, just so everyone knows what they're signing up for. So this will be the first time. If you have any questions at any point, just let me know. So our chair and vice chair are elected each February by members of the board and serve for one year. You can serve a maximum of three consecutive years in each role. After you've been off for one year, you can return to your former role if you'd like to and if elected. As host of the assembly, the chair performs a number of duties, specifically running meetings in accordance with the agenda. The vice chair serves in the chair's absence only. Both of them, whoever's serving as the presiding officer, it needs to make sure that order is maintained during the meetings. <clears throat> uh, the chair and vice chair vote on all motions unless a conflict of interest exists. However, they, whoever is serving as the presiding officer cannot make or second the motions. And finally, the presiding officer signs the minutes after they are approved. So the required knowledge to serve as chair or vice chair is making sure that you have an understanding of basic parliamentary procedure, especially for motions, understanding the procedures for public comment, which we are going to begin providing. That way you've got an easy resource if needed. Make sure that you understand the process for legislative and quasi-judicial public hearings, understand and assist staff with enforcing the Sunshine Law, understand the basics of Florida's public records law, Make sure you're familiar with the bylaws, as well as the approval criteria for the uh, public hearings that you have, typically for your board, that's just going to be the canal construction special permits. The board member handbook does cover all of these topics and we will be sending out a revised copy of that shortly. City clerk's office staff will provide additional training to whoever is elected chair and vice chair and we're always available to answer any questions you may have. As far as running the meetings go, staff will assist with this, but before the chair calls the meeting to order, we need to make sure that there is a quorum present. The chair is going to decide whether or not it's necessary to review the full public comment procedures, depending on items that are being presented to the board. The chair is in charge of using a timer, either one we provide or one on your cell phone, to make sure that public comment is limited to three, per, uh, three minutes per individual. They will place business on the floor by reading the agenda items title and keep discussions focused. This can involve reminding members of the purpose of the item and remaining areas to be addressed and calling for a motion if no new points are being made. The chair needs to end sidebar conversations between members if they do happen to occur and ensure that proper motions are made. This includes calling for motions when necessary, ensuring a motion is seconded before the discussion begins stating that the motion has died if it does not 
uh, receive a second. Restating the motion following any discussion and calling for both an I vote and a nay vote on each motion and then announcing whether the motion has carried unanimously, carried, or failed. As for maintaining order, we hope that the chair will lead by example, make sure that he is adhering to the rules of conduct and ensuring that board members do as well, be fair and impartial in treatment of board members, staff, and the public, and any applicants that come before you, insist unruly or disorderly individuals be courteous in their language and presentation, request individuals who fail to comply to leave the meeting, recess the meeting if order cannot be maintained so that staff can assist in restoring it, ensure members wait to be recognized before they speak and intervene if board members debate or argue with each other to assert their opinion. And as always, the chair has a lovely little gavel that can be pulled out to assist them in any of those steps. And that's all we have. Do we have any questions before we hold the election? No. All right, in that case, I open the floor for nominations for chair. So uh, I would like to nominate uh, Rick Doherty. All right, do we have any other nominations? No other nominations? In that case, Rick Darty has been appointed chair by acclamation. <laughs> so I would also like to open the floor for nominations for vice chair. And you can always nominate yourself if you're wanting to serve. I'd like to nominate uh, Ian, please. All right, do we have any other nominations? No further nominations? In that case, congratulations, Mr. Milne. You are appointed vice chair by acclamation. Thank you so much, Sean. <laughs> All right, so do we need to call this meeting to order? Or are we done? No, Dan, you can call it to order. You can call it to order when All you're right, done. All right, this meeting is called to order. I am sorry, yes. Uh, we will actually be transferring the gavel over to <laughs> All right. Thank you. It's going to Ian. Okay, now's the, t now's the time we uh, ask for uh, public comments. Anyone wishing to address the uh, Burnt Straws Canal Advisory Committee on any subject may do so at the appropriate time during the meeting. Those who choose to speak must state their name for the record. Each person will be allowed to speak for a maximum of three minutes. Number one, approval of the minutes. Do I have a uh, motion to approve the minutes of uh, the meeting on January 10th, 2023? Yeah, I move to approve as presented. Is there a second? I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. It's, uh, the minutes are approved. Reports. We'll start with the finance report from January 2023. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Kathy Miller, Canal Maintenance, for the record. In your packet, you have your monthly budget reports. Are there any questions, concerns, comments? Moving on to the budget utilization report. So as you can see, we haven't spent any money, but I'm getting ready to spend some money. Um, in April, I am already talking with the contractor about mangrove trimming, so we're gonna try to get some mangrove trimming accomplished in April. Um, let's see. Seawall replacement, just to give you a little bit of a Hurricane Ian update, uh, we're hoping to get that, con that contract on the streets this week. Florida uh, federal guidelines recommend that we have that contract on the streets for 30 days. So we're still looking at another 30 days before we even get started on any of those. We have one high priority seawall replacement in burnt store aisles. That project will be replaced first when that contractor starts in BSI. Questions, comments? Okay. Moving on to the seawall um, replacement status report. 
Any questions, concerns? Nope. This is pretty much what we looked at last month. So, Kathy, I guess my question is, uh, of the items that are um, seawall replacement prior to uh, our deciding or having the storm, prior to the event, um, how uh, can we replace the high priority ones before FEMA comes in or do we have to wait for them? If we want to be reimbursed by FEMA, we have to wait for FEMA. Okay. Because we have to have a federalized contract. There's a lot of language and a lot of strings attached to a federalized contract. Okay. So we pretty much have to wait for them unless you guys want to pay for it. Uh, your particular high priority project, the erosion is under control. I don't see any structures at risk. I don't see any reason why we can't wait okay. for them to start. I don't see where it's an emergency. Okay. Okay. That was really my question here. So okay. we're going to go ahead with the ones that we had already uh, decided a year ago, or you had decided a year ago to, to move forward with, and then we'll wait no. for FEMA to catch up? No. Nope. The work program has been tossed off to the side for now. What we're doing is we're focusing mainly on Hurricane Ian recovery. And once we get done with those seawalls, then we'll go back and revisit those seawalls. We do have some seawalls that were already in the work program. I think it's highlighted in yellow on your sheets. Okay. My agenda's a little tossed. Um, so we had one project, I think it was San Massimo. Mm -hmm. And because we had identified this as something that needed to be replaced, it's not eligible for FEMA anyhow. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, we just have the one project, San Massimo. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving right along. Uh, permits authorized by city. It looks like we have six permits out there. Are there any questions about those permits? No. Concerns? No. Okay. The uh, capital improvement status report. Go ahead, Mr. Harrington. I know you want to ask me. Where are we at with the boat widening? Come on. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that has taken a, um, a back seat for now. I am, I am so overwhelmed with dealing with FEMA, getting FEMA information. They just keep asking more and more information. Um, just a couple weeks ago, they gave us the go-ahead to get the contracts out. Don't wait on us. Don't wait on us to do the inspections because they're, they're stat. They're short staffed, they're spread pretty thin. So they gave us a go ahead to go ahead and get our contracts out on the street. So that's what we're focused on. So realistically, when do we think we will get to, to this? Good question. What I would like to discuss with the committee is that we wait until our bids come in and mm -hmm. we look at the schedules and determine when we wanna do that. As this is my recommendation. I fear that if we have that lock compromised, barges can't get in and out to do the seawall recovery. And for me right now, the seawall recovery is a priority. Mm -hmm. so, so if we want to wait another 60 days, see when those bids come in, we can do that. But for right now, I'm, I'm very much focused on seawall recovery and, and getting all the information that FEMA wants. So, okay. But the project is still a priority for me. Please understand that. Oh, no, I know. I, I, okay. I, I'm just shocked at how much activity that's getting now. I, I, you know, for the you know, time, you can um, hours without seeing anybody, and, and now it's routine that you're coming in and going out, you got to wait for somebody. Yeah. Yeah, it is crazy. Our waterways are pretty crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this time around, working with FEMA, they're asking for a lot of maintenance information a lot of historical information. Um, it's not like with Hurricane Irma, okay? They're, they're just asking for a lot of documentation. They want GPS points on everything, you know, so we're doing the best we can to give them everything that they need to help us move along, okay. so. Okay, anything else? Okay. Oh, good report. Permit report, so we have an Army Corps of Engineers permit. We got it just last week, so we can install riprap and seawalls, okay? Great. Great. We could always install seawalls. We were just under the old permit, but now we're under the new permit. 
New permit expires March 10th, I think, what is it, 2033 or something like that? 2031. 31, 2031, yeah. thank you. So that was, that was a huge hurdle. It only took us two years to get that permit. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but we got it. We got it. Okay. <coughs> Any questions? Anything else? Okay, um, I just want to remind everybody that if you want to put something on the agenda, if you have questions or anything else like that, the best way to communicate with me right now is by email. Okay, if I don't have an opportunity to answer my phone all the time, so I can't get back with you. So if you email me, I can always answer those at home okay. and on the run. So, so one, one additional question, I don't see it on the agenda, was um, keep hoping to see the um, perimeter channel uh, presentation. Right. So Mr. Disher, who created that, is um, he is out, and we don't know when to expect him back. Okay. So um, I need to like really pick his brain on that. And I think our our computer software stuff here, I don't know if it can handle that or not, because it's it operates under a software. He has to log into our uh, into our program, into our network to run the software. I'm not really sure how all that goes. So okay. I think that's a pretty high priority for understanding just what do we do with some of the other items that are on um, sort of the back lot of, of things to consider, particularly the corner widening. Yes. Okay. I think that was the purpose of that whole presentation. Yeah. Um, so the corner widening, we weren't going to start, like, like this fiscal year, we were going to hire a consultant to start with the permitting process. We, we figure it's going to take years to move forward with any of that because there's still land acquisition that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And over the next five or six years, we're just we're just saving money. I think we're saving like 100000 every year. We're putting $100,000 every year into the account, and we're just saving money, you know, stuff like that. So, so we know that land acquisition is going to, you know, that's going to take a little bit. Permitting is going to take a little bit. But before we can acquire the land, we need to know what we're going to do first. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but hopefully we will have that back on the agenda next month if Mr. Disher returns. Okay. I am not capable of presenting that. Okay. I did not create it. I don't know enough about it. So my apologies. Yeah. Anything else? No? Nope. I believe. Okay. Nice report. Committee training, is that you? Okay. So we do have another presentation to do today, and this will also be an annual presentation going forward, just to help keep everyone fresh on the rules and procedures you're expected to follow as a committee member. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop me, and I'll do my best to answer them. So effective boards for the city, we believe that it's important for them to remain forward-looking, understand their duties and responsibilities, Prioritize the purpose of the board over personal desires. Treat staff, the public, and fellow members with respect. Follow council's adopted rules of conduct, which are respect each person, share responsibility, criticize only ideas, not people, keep an open mind, question and participate, attend all meetings, listen constructively. Our chair and vice chair, we've gone over now. We do have the elections every year in February. And additionally, if a chair or vice chair goes off the board, we will call a meeting, uh, an election at the following meeting. We'll skip through this bit since you should all be fresh on that. For our board members, you're responsible for reading agenda material in advance, speaking with staff regarding non-agenda issues before or after a meeting, Listen respectfully to fellow members, staff, applicants, and the public. 
We're hoping that everyone will begin to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. That way we don't have issues where uh, members might speak over each other, which can make it difficult for the recording secretary to transcribe. We ask that everyone refer to the chair by title, Mr. Chair, in this case. Focus comments and discussions on the item at hand. Speak clearly and audibly into the microphone. These are quite sensitive, finicky. Refrain from engaging in sidebar conversations as that is a Sunshine Live violation that does have certain consequences we hope none of you will ever face. Refrain from use of profanity or during public meetings and board members need to be the ones who make and must vote on all motions unless there is prejudice in a quasi-judicial proceeding like a canal construction special permit. Um, that would be if someone had made a comment to their friends out in the public or perhaps made a statement to the paper that you are for or against a canal construction special permit that will be coming before the board. If that happens, then you would have to uh, abstain from voting on that matter. The other situation where someone would refrain from voting is a conflict of interest as defined by state statute. It would not be something like, well, this person is my neighbor. I don't feel comfortable voting. It typically involves um, monetary gain or loss. We also ask that all board members conform to all rules established by the city, including the quasi-judicial meeting procedures, rules outlined in the board member handbook, the city's rules of conduct, the city's facility rules, and any advice given from the city's attorneys. So many of you are now familiar with our office. The city clerk's office is the one who is responsible for tracking appointments and attendance at each meeting, administering the oath of office before anyone serves. Now we're providing orientations and educational materials to new members. We assist with meeting procedures as needed during the meetings. And Leah is our recording secretary who is in charge of preparing minutes and recordings for uh, members. The supporting department for your board is um, Canal Maintenance and Public Works. They're the individuals who provide a board secretary who creates issues and distributes the agenda for your board. That is Laurel Adelmund currently. They also provide staff who present the agenda items and reports and can answer board member questions in advance of meetings if you have any. They can also share the information with other members if you think it would be useful for everyone to know uh, whatever you've learned. So quorum, before we start a meeting, we have to make sure that we have a physical quorum in the room. For your board, that is going to be three members out of a total possible five. <coughs> It's required in order to call the meeting to order and must be maintained throughout the meeting. So if we had three members present and started the meeting, but one of them needs to step out of the room to take a call or what have you, then the meeting has to be temporarily recessed until that third member can rejoin. Without a quorum, the board is limited to taking these actions, recessing so that staff can take measures to obtain a quorum. And if it can't be obtained, adjourning the meeting. Do we have any questions so far? For our meeting etiquette, we ask that everyone arrive prepared and seated five to 10 minutes in advance. That way we can determine if there is a quorum and if we need to get on the phones with anybody to try to find out if they're on the way. Yeah. Speakers should be recognized by the chair before they begin speaking. Only one person should speak at a time. Comments need to be confined to the current issue with repetition avoided. It's sufficient to say if you concur with someone, you can just say, I agree. Discussion should alternate between pro and con arguments when possible. Sometimes everyone is on the same page, so we recognize that won't always happen. We ask that lengthy pa papers not be read during the meetings, and sidebar conversations are prohibited as they are a Sunshine Law violation, and that would be uh, cases such as leaning over to your fellow member and speaking with them privately while the meeting is going on. Verbal attacks of members, staff, applicants, and the public are not to be tolerated, and rules are to be respected and obeyed. Our meeting procedures involve the chair determining if we have a quorum and then calling the meeting to order, reviewing the public comment procedures as necessary, using the timer to limit the public comment to three minutes if there is any, placing business on the floor by reading the agenda item title. The current agenda item has to be dispensed before proceeding on to the next item. Sometimes that involves making a motion or just confirming that there's no further discussion. 
The chair keeps discussions focused. This can involve reminding members of the purpose of the item and remaining areas to be addressed, calling for a motion if no new points are made, ending sidebar conversations if they are observed, and ensuring proper motions are made, which includes calling for a motion when necessary, ensuring the motion is seconded before discussion begins, announcing that the motion has died if it is not seconded, restating the motion after any discussion, and then calling for both an aye and a nay vote and announcing the result of the vote. The chair also adjourns the meeting after all agenda items have been addressed. Public hearings are heard by this board and they can involve presentations of up to 30 minutes by staff, an applicant and interveners when applicable, followed by a public comment period. The public comment period is intended for members to take in the views of the public. It is not a question and answer session. We strongly discourage uh, the board from participating in a question and answer session. Comments are limited to a maximum of three minutes per speaker. There is no limit to the number of people who can speak. The chair calls three times for public comment, after which it's closed by motion. Members can then discuss the matter before them and a motion is required to either recommend approval or approval with conditions or denial or continuance to a date certain for legislative public hearings. Most of those that you will have though are quasi-judicial, so you will actually be approving, approving with conditions or denying canal construction special permits when those are heard. Those voting in opposition to a request must cite a reason for doing so following the vote. I have a question yes. on this page. Um, backing up to, <laughs> I know we've had confusion about the chair calling three times for public comment. The public comment is opened and then they're making their comments and then if we hear no more comments, that's when the chair calls three times. You've already once called once at that point, so you would need to call at least two more times. Okay. And then you would continue calling at possibly more than that if people continue to come up until no one else comes up. Gotcha. So there's a total of three times that the chair would call for public comment. If there's no further public comment after the third time, then we call for a motion to close public com the hearing. Correct. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. So for our quasi-judicial public hearings, the canal construction special permits, those apply policy through the application of facts to specific criteria. Quasi-judicial public hearings must be held in accordance with the procedures adopted by the city in resolution 3673-2022. This ensures fairness, impartiality, and due process for all parties. That procedure is included in the board member handbook. <coughs> Disclosure of ex parte communications related to land use matters conducted pursuant to chapter 26 of the Pentagord are not required and not presumed prejudicial to the board's decision. However, the city attorney has opined such meetings should be avoided once a public hearing has been scheduled to maintain the integrity of the decision-making process. You may have heard about that at recent council meetings. The decisions you are making, though, are based in Chapter 6, so that decision does not apply to you. If you have questions about it, uh, let us know and we can pass any questions you have on to the attorney. So the way the quasi-judicial public hearings work is that the recording secretary will swear in all of the participants, the chair announces the item, staff provides a presentation of up to 30 minutes, and there is also time for a cross-examination by the applicant, any party interveners, and questions from the board, separate from their 30 minutes for presentation. The applicant also <coughs> has um, an opportunity to present evidence and testimony in support of their application up to 30 minutes. They also have a separate time for cross-examination by staff, party interveners, or questions from the board that does not account, does not count against their 30 minutes to make their presentation. Any timely filed party interveners may also present evidence and testimony in support of or in opposition to the application up to 30 minutes. They too also have a separate period of time for cross-examination by staff, the applicant, and any questions from the board. Any other individuals who wish to submit relevant information may do so after that, up to three minutes each, separate from the uh, public comment period that was held at the beginning of the meeting. The chair calls three times for public comment and then the public hearing is closed by motion. 
if necessary, uh, an attorney may be present to provide legal advice to the board. Then members deliberate and pass a motion, um, and again, with the canal construction special permits, this will be either to approve, to approve with conditions, or to deny the application. Any member voting in opposition of an application must cite a specific criteria not being met and provide a statement regarding how the application fails to meet that criteria. These are the rules of evidence that are contained in the quasi-judicial public uh, hearing procedures. I cannot answer questions about this, but we can forward them to our attorney if you have any. All evidence of a type commonly relied upon by reasonably prudent persons in the conduct of their affairs shall be admissible, whether or not such evidence would be admissible in a court of law in Florida. Irrelevant, immaterial, harassing, defamatory, or unduly repetitive ed evidence shall be excluded. Hearsay evidence may be used for the purposes of supplementing or explaining other evidence, but it shall not be sufficient by itself to support a finding unless it would be admissible over objection in a civil action. Documentary evidence may be presented in the form of a copy or the original. Upon request, parties shall be given an opportunity to compare the copy with the original. Not all admissible evidence may be the basis of a finding by the board. Only competent substantial evidence may be the basis of the findings. As noted above, competent substantial evidence is defined as relevant material evidence that a reasonable mind would accept as adequate to support the conclusions reached. Do we have any questions to pass on? All right. Next up, we have parliamentary procedure. The city does not strictly follow Robert's rules of order. We expect that the chair will explain to the public what the board is doing, keep the public informed throughout the process of what the board is doing with an item, particularly with our public hearings where um, regular citizens may not understand the process. And of course, the chair should announce the result of any action taken by the board, such as if a canal construction special permit were denied, then they would need to make a statement that that means that um, that dock or what have you may not be built. Members should wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking, stay focused on the topic at hand, avoid repetitious discussion, make motions as needed. Motions signal a desire to take a specific action and they're voted on by all members at the dais. There are seven steps to making motions. First, a member should ask to be recognized by the chair by stating, Mr. Chair. The chair then recognizes the member by name. The member can then state their motion. I move to recommend approval of the application. Another member seconds the motion without waiting to be recognized by saying, I second the motion. If not seconded, the motion dies and no further discussion will be had on that motion and there will be no vote taken. The chair announces that the motion has died. Discussion does not begin until the motion is seconded. The chair repeats the motion once it is seconded and calls for discussion. Following any discussion, the chair restates the motion and puts it to a vote. If there was no further discussion, uh, we are ready to vote. All those in favor of the recommend of recommending the application be approved, signal so by saying aye. Those opposed, signal so by saying nay. The chair counts the votes and announces the outcome. If there is a tie vote, that is considered a failed vote and in a following motion would need to be made. Only the prevailing side of a failed motion may offer a subsequent motion on the item. For example, if you wanted to reconsider something the board has already taken action on, Someone from the side that had um, received the majority votes would be the one who would need to make that subsequent motion to reconsider the item. Motions may be amended by any member following those same seven steps. They don't have to be offered by the person who made or seconded the motion. Only two amendments may be offered on the floor at one time before the second must be acted on. If the second amendment passes, it's incorporated into the first amendment. Following any remaining discussion of the first amendment, a vote then has to be taken on it and uh, the chair has to restate the main motion incorporating any amendments that were approved and then ask for any further discussion. At that point, we would still need a vote on the main motion. 
So there are three types of amendments. There are additions where new words are added, such as adding subject to legal review after approved. Deletions where you might decide uh, that instead of saying subject to legal review, you'd rather it just be subject to review. Or substitutions such as changing staff review out for legal review. So here we have an example of how that entire process would work. Mr. Smith might move to recommend approval of a plat application. Ms. Jacobson seconds the motion. The chair restates that motion. Uh, one of the members then signals that they would like to speak to the chair. The chair recognizes them and then they move to amend the motion by adding subject to staff review after application and someone seconds that motion. Someone else signals they would like to speak and then the chair recognizes them and they move to amend the amendment by replacing staff with legal and that has to be seconded as well or else it will die. The chair can then ask if there is any discussion of the amendment and if not, um, call for those in favor of amending the amendment by replacing staff with legal to signal so by saying aye and then call for those opposed to signal so by saying nay. If the motion carries, then the amendment on the floor would now be um, to add subject to legal, legal review after application. The chair would need to call for any further discussion, and if there is none, then they would need to call on, uh, call for a vote on that amendment. If that were to carry, then they would still need to restate the initial motion and call for a vote on that final motion. There are a number of motions that can be made to address items such as calling for a point of privilege, which um, is a little more difficult to do here. An example of that would be if it were too noisy in the room, we could close those doors to seal off the area a little bit so noise from the exterior doesn't come in. However, um, there's not much we can do to address issues such as temperature while we're here. You could call for a division of the House, which would be calling for a clarifying vote to determine who voted in favor of and who voted against a motion. If there are questions about um, whether someone voted aye or nay or whether a motion passed or failed. Items can be laid on the table indefinitely, potentially. If there's a public hearing, we would ask that um, if there's a continuance, that item be continued to a date certain. That way the applicant and anyone else present knows when they would need to reappear to be heard on that matter. Motions can be made to call the question on the floor and end debate. That does need to be seconded and a vote does need to be taken. There can be motions to amend motions we just went over, to reconsider a previously approved motion, to rescind a motion entirely, and of course, just your general, I move to take action on an item. I missed your, uh, the part about consideration of a question. What? I'm sorry, that would be if you object to a motion that okay. has been made. Any other questions at this point? No. And we do have a binder that we'll be providing in the future as soon as we receive an okay on a couple items from our attorney that does include a cheat sheet of all the different kinds of motions and the requirements for those motions. It does also have the approval criteria that need to be considered for canal construction special permits. Okay. That way that'll be at hand easily. So the Sunshine Law, you are subject to the Sunshine Law as a public board. It applies to any physical or virtual gathering of two or more members of the same elected or appointed board. No two or more members of a board may discuss city business outside of a properly noticed public meeting, which has been called to order, which has a quorum, and at which minutes are taken. Discussion of city business before the meeting is called to order or following adjournment is a violation of the Sunshine Law, and there are a variety of consequences that could be imposed if a member of the public were to file a complaint with the Commission on Ethics. Written correspondence by one member to inform others of a subject to be discussed at a meeting is not a violation unless discussion takes place prior to the meeting. For example, if one of you had information you wanted to share with everyone else about an item before the meeting, it's not a violation to just send that information and say, I thought this might uh, be informative. If anyone were to reply to that message, though, with comments on what they think about it, you've begun a discussion. So one option you have to make sure that doesn't ever occur 
is you can forward whatever you would like shared to our office and we can send it out to members blind copying everyone that way a discussion can't inadvertently begin mm -hmm. telephone participants Participation by an absent member is only permissible when there is a quorum of the board physically present and the absence is due to extraordinary circumstances such as illness and the board approves such participation. We would likely need advance notice of that though as um, we had a phone that we could easily use to provide uh, decent audio for the missing member and we don't have that here. So definitely let us know if you have a surgery scheduled or anything like that, and we will try to make arrangements if possible. Non-disruptive or silent videotaping of a public meeting cannot be banned. So if someone were to come to this room and have a camera out going, we're also recording the meeting. Anyone could come in here and record the meeting. We can't tell them to leave because they are recording. Consequences for violation of the Sunshine Law include criminal penalties, removal from office, non-criminal charges, fines, and attorney fees. Members of the board are also uh, subject to the Florida Public Records Law. Each person involved in the business conducted by the city, including board members, has the responsibility to protect, preserve, store, transfer, destroy, or otherwise dispose of, use, and manage public records only in accordance with the applicable federal, state, and local law and such rules as may be promulgated or approved by the city. Public records are defined as all documents, papers, letters, maps, books, tapes, photographs, films, sound recordings, data processing software, computer records, email, or other material, regardless of physical form, characteristics, or means of transmission, made or received pursuant to law or ordinance, or in connection with the transaction of official business by any agency, such as the city. The Florida Supreme Court interpreted this to encompass all materials made or received by an agency or board in connection with official business, which are used to perpetuate, communicate, or formalize knowledge. The content of a document determines if a record is a public record, not the format. So um, just because something might be digital instead of something you can hold in a hand, that doesn't prevent it from being considered a public record. Public records do include social media posts regarding official business. So if you're out there posting on Facebook about an item that's going to come before the board, that is actually public record, which will need to be maintained in accordance with the general uh, records retention schedules that the state puts forward. Records to or from board members regarding city business are public records. Public records must be retained and disposed of in accordance with the state's general record schedules. At the end of a member's term of appointment, records should be provided to a member's successor or the city clerk's office. We're happy to take anything you may have that needs to be retained for you. Records must not be destroyed or otherwise disposed of prior to meeting the required retention period established per the appropriate state general records schedule. Members' agenda packets need not be retained as the city clerk's office maintains the record copy of all such material. What you have is just a duplicate. If a member of the public were to email you about an item coming before the board, that's going to be a public record. If that happens, you can forward that email to us, or if you're responding, copy us on the email um, using the email address retention at cityofpuntagordafl.com so that we can make sure that that email is retained for the appropriate period of time. Okay. And this email address is also included in the newest versions of the board member handbook, and we will be reissuing that to everybody. Members are subject to certain rules regarding ethics. Florida Statutes Chapter 112 Part 3 provides for the Code of Ethics for Public Officers and Employees, a Guide to the Sunshine Amendment and Code of Ethics for Public Officers and Employees is published annually by the Florida Commission on Ethics. We'd be happy to provide you with a copy of the most recent one if you would like. The law details prohibited actions and conduct, voting conflicts of interest, financial disclosures, among other items, but these are the ones that are most pertinent to board members. Penalties for violating the code of ethics range from a misdemeanor to a felony of the third degree, as well as removal from office, public censure, a civil penalty not to exceed $10,000, 
and restitution of any pecuniary benefits received. Article 2, Section 5 of the Florida Constitution prohibits any person from serving on more than one decision-making board. The Canal Advisory Committees are decision-making since you are approving or denying canal construction special permits, so you wouldn't be able to hold office with another of our decision-making boards, such as the Code Enforcement Board or the Building Board. Do we have any other questions so far? If the official decision, ruling, or act occurs in the context of a quasi-judicial proceeding, a member may abstain from voting on such matter if the abstention is to assure a fair proceeding free from potential bias or prejudice. That would again be in the case that you were making statements that um, revealed any kind of bias before the matter is being heard. Florida Statutes 286.012 requires members abstain from voting in certain situations. And we have a copy of the pertinent statute right here. I'll, it's in your agenda package, so I will save you all from rereading it. Similarly, we also included Florida Statute 112.3143, uh, a link to that. It, this isn't verbatim, so I will go through this real quick. Individuals must abstain from voting on a measure which would inure to his or her special private gain or loss or inure to the special private gain or loss of a relative business associate or principal other than the government agency by whom he or she is retained, including the parent, subsidiary, or sibling organization of a principal by which he or she is retained. Relative means the elected or appointed individual's father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, brother, sister, father-in-law, mother-in-law, son-in-law, or daughter-in-law. A business associate means any person or entity engaged in or carrying on a business enterprise with the officer as a partner, joint venture, co-owner of property, or corporate shareholder where the shares of the corporation are not listed on any national or regional stock exchange. So um, this one might come to play if one of you worked for a marine contractor who had an item that was being presented to the board or potentially um, if you were the one presenting it and that would benefit from it. Another situation which could potentially arise is if you have uh, one of the family members they named that happens to live within the district and they came forward to apply for a canal construction special permit. It's very rare that a member is going to have a conflict of interest as defined in the state statutes. So if you ever feel that you might have one, just contact us and we'll work with our attorney to determine whether one actually exists. So. That's the end. <laughs> any other it. questions? Right, no, th I don't have any questions. That was outstanding. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody got questions? <clears throat> and if anyone happens to think of an area that you wish there was more information on, let us know and we can fill you in on that. And we could also incorporate it into future presentations to make sure everyone has what they need to be successful. Thank you. Great. When, when will we get uh, our new handbooks? Um, I think it might be ready to go. I'll double check with the city clerk, but I believe we finalized the last change we needed to make just on Monday. Okay, do we need to come by your office and get them or how do um, we do that? We're going to be emailing them to everyone. Okay. So, um, super duper. Expect that soon. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Staff comments. N no staff comments, uh, member comments. That being the case, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Yeah, I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. Thank you very much, everybody. There you go. <laughs> I'm going to break that stuff.